so I've uh, shared before, but people don't believe me, um, that how directionally challenged I am. In fact, people who are good at directions really sort of, they don't believe anybody when they say, oh, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Because when they say, and they never say the whole name of the road, right? It's like, oh yeah, it's down there on spa. You just take generals to defense, to tchotchke, to chicken finger, and then traffic circle, you take the third, you know, what? And they sort of look at you like you've asked them, what state do we live in? They're like, you take spa down to tchotchke, to chicken finger, and it, what? It, I, I still, and so, uh, you know, we, but I, I think about that, and I, th I think about that with this story, because this story is my worst nightmare. Uh, last year in Colorado, there was an accident right in between where Denver and the town of Aurora are. There was an accident on one of the main roads, and so Google Maps, the savior for all of us directionally challenged people, uh, had uh, a had a route correction because of the accident. Now, I don't know what your Google Maps does. My Google Maps, if you are actually driving somewhere and you are in the midst of your trip and it says, hey, we found a quicker way, you've got like three nanoseconds to decide if you want that quicker way or not. And if you don't hit cancel, it just automatically takes you that way, right? So, what happened was uh, the, there was this accident, and so Google Maps took people down, uh, they took, made them take a left and, and went down this way and made them take a right, at which point one of the people interviewed said, it felt like a strange detour, but it told me that instead of going 43 minutes from my destination, it would only take 22 minutes. And with that kind of change, I decided to go with it. Besides, Google Maps, how often is Google Maps wrong, she says, right? So she, she talks about driving down this way and seeing it being more rural than she expected and seeing a long line of cars. And she said, that's when I knew we were fine because all these other cars had been taken the same way by Google Maps. So you go down this way, take a right, and, and the, uh, the next part of the road is around a curve so people couldn't tell that once you went around that curve, you went about 100 yards out into a muddy field. Google Maps had directed people out into a muddy field. Over 150 motor, motorists, 150 cars, got stuck in this field because they just kept coming and coming and coming and they couldn't stop. And all of them, when in, in uh, you know, the two or three that they interviewed for this uh, news story about it, all of them talked, had that same sort of like, what were we supposed to do? You know, it's like the, uh, like the episode of The Office where they drive into the lake because, the, because it tells them to, right? Like, it's, uh, there's this, um, this, this sort of sense of, well, you know, Google Maps said to go there. What was I supposed to do, right? What was I supposed to do? And that, like I said, that is my nightmare because I don't know places or things or whatever. And you know, uh, Sarah and all these other people who are so good at it and be like, oh, well you just get off here and then take a right and take a left and take a right and take a left and then you're right back on. Oh, that's helpful. Thanks so much for that. That's good. But the, the reality is that whether you are driving or uh, in life, we always need to be reflecting on and asking, where are we going? And maybe more importantly, who are you following to get there? Our series that we are continuing is uh, the, the series that we do every January that we call called We Are CPBC. And the idea behind We Are CPBC is that uh, we have this set of practices that we do that make us College Parkway, that make us who we are, that we come back to over and over and over again. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about through the love of Jesus, we gather at the table. We talked about we gather at the communion table, but we also gather around tables on Wednesday nights. We gather around tables in each other's homes. We talked about that when we gather at the table, what we are doing is that we are remembering the, the Lord's table. We are remembering communion. We are remembering the life and the death of Jesus, but we are also anticipating. We are anticipating that one day, all of us who claim Jesus as our own will be at an eternal feast with him 
forever. We gather around the table so that we are better known to each other and so that we are better known to God. We talked last week about the idea that through the love of Jesus, we serve joyfully. That part of what we do and part of what we're called to do is is to serve. That God has made us so that it's not just about us. That we are called to serve other people. But that the temptation so often is to just sort of go through the motions. And just sort of begrudgingly do it like so many of us do laundry or taxes or whatever, right? But the reality is that God calls you into service, but a joyful service, a service that transforms you and the person you are serving. And that, and that requires joyfulness. That requires you being right where God's called you to be and doing what God's called you to do. That that's part of what it means to be part of College Parkway is that we work very hard to help each other figure out where we are supposed to be and how we are supposed to be serving and then provide opportunities for that. And today, what we are talking about is that we at College Parkway, through the love of Jesus, we make disciples who make disciples. So the first question that we're coming back to is, where are you going, right? When we uh, don't know where we're going and what's going on, we look to maps, we look to uh, things that can guide us and shape us and show us where we are called to go. And when we wind up in the wrong place, we wind up either literally or metaphorically stuck in the mud. And so if you are to ask our culture, where are we going? There would be one answer, right? There, where are you going is that you want to go someplace where you have lots of power, where you make lots of money, where you have all of the perks and benefits and joys uh, of this life, right? You want an easy life. As Christians, or if you are interested in becoming a Christian, hopefully your answer would be different. Hopefully your answer would be that What you want is to go where God is, that you want to be right in the midst of the kingdom and the presence of God, both now and forever, that that is what you are looking for, that that is what you are deciding to follow. And that is that sense of what it means to do that, to go that way, that definition of how could we get there? How can we go to to be in God's presence, both now and forevermore? That's what we tackle when we talk about making disciples who make disciples. Because the first followers of Jesus, Jesus came up to them in their different lives and their different settings and said, hey, follow me. And many of them dropped everything they possibly had and followed him as quickly as they possibly could. From the very beginning, there was something unique and compelling about Jesus that drew people in. Jesus didn't yell at them. Jesus didn't emotionally manipulate them into saying that if they make the wrong choice or say the wrong word, that God would punish them forever. Jesus instead say, hey, this way, this thing that I'm doing is going to be so good, so compelling, so beautiful, you're going to want to be a part of it. And I want you to come be a part of it with me. These first followers of Jesus then followed him everywhere. They didn't just show up at the synagogue for an hour every Sabbath and go, okay, I feel like I'm good. We'll check you next week. They lived with him. They followed him. They watched every interaction that he did. They watched every teaching that they did. They asked every possible question, both incredibly profound and incredibly dumb and wrong-handed. Every possible question they could to know and get to know him better. These first followers were his disciples. And as he is following, as he is showing them what to do, they are modeling and living this different kind of life. Now, of course, they didn't do it perfectly. And when persecution came, they ran, but they came back. After experiencing Jesus, after experiencing his life and all that there was to know about him, they couldn't go back to normal life. Something was different, and they had to be a part of that. The part of what God called, Jesus called those initial disciples to is the same thing that Jesus calls us to if we are to be disciples, because that's what God calls of us is not just to be members of a church, not just to be how we would define Christian, but to be disciples that God said, go and make disciples that we are called to be disciples. And I found this great definition of disciple this week uh, by this author named Jim Putnam. And he says, a disciple does three things. The first thing the disciple does is follow Jesus. Now we all can get this. 
I would define following Jesus as you have made a profession of faith that God, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You've asked him to forgive you of your sins and you promise to live for him, right? That is how we would define salvation. That, that idea is that we follow Jesus. But Jim has two more that he, he includes to, in this definition of disciple. The second thing is that we allow Jesus to change us. And here's where it gets awkward, right? Because we're totally fine letting Jesus pay the price for all of our sins and all of our trials and all of the things that we've done wrong so that we could be with him forever in heaven. But now we're asking Jesus to change us and we're allowing Jesus to have authority over our heart and our lives so that when Jesus says, go this way, even when we want to go this way, we choose to follow. We do what Jesus asks of us. And the only way that we can know what Jesus asks of us is to be studying the scripture, is to be praying, is to be connected with the Holy Spirit, is to be connected in community, that we allow Jesus to change us. And the third thing that makes a disciple. So you follow Jesus, you allow Jesus to change you, and you are on mission with God. That meaning that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. God has something that will be better for you than you can possibly ever imagine. Now, better may not be your definition of better, but in the end, better will be really, really better than anything you could possibly imagine. And God wants you to be willing and faithful to go that way and to do that thing. You can choose not to. There aren't huge buzzers that go off and zaps when you go the wrong direction. It's not operation that if you hit the, hit the edge, everything buzzes. This, this is your desire and your belief that following Jesus and being his disciple is better than anything else you could possibly do. Now, churches, you probably grew up in all, we've all grown up in all sorts of different churches that have all sorts of different experiences, but... Churches have done all sorts of things calling people disciples. They have uh, brought people in by arguing them into faith. They have brought people in by emotionally manipulating them into faith. They've brought people in by saying you have to go around this cute little baseball diamond, and if you check off these four boxes of things you need to do, then you're a disciple. But none of those feel real, and all of those just feel like some sort of extra homework that doesn't mean anything. When I think of discipleship and I think of Jesus, Jesus says, follow me. And if your image of Jesus isn't so compelling that you are tempted to drop everything and follow him, you have the wrong image of Jesus. Because Jesus could transform people simply by being in their presence. And that Jesus is the Jesus we still follow. That Jesus is the Jesus that still beckons us to come and to be disciples. And that's the Jesus that instructed his original disciples and us that our job is not simply to come and high five each other over how great and amazing it is that God loves us, but to take what we have been given and then make more disciples. Go and make disciples, Jesus says in what we call the Great Commission, baptizing them in my name and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. That Jesus takes all that we have been given and all that we know and says, go and make more people that will follow me. That is a problem for us, if we're really honest. Because we know bullhorn people who will stand on corners, metaphorically or literally, yelling about how all these awful sinners need to come to the love and grace of God. And if you can't hear God's love and someone yelling at you through a bullhorn, then how can you hear God's love? We know people who talk about Jesus all the time, but are some of the meanest, most ornery, most judgmental people we've ever met. And we go, don't think I want any part of that. But we also know that when, if we're really honest, when the pastor says God wants us to go and make disciples, maybe the scariest part is us going, ooh, I don't want to do that. Because if I start that conversation with somebody, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to ask me a question that I don't know anything about. Somebody's going to say, you want to talk about Jesus, but I just saw you do this the other day. 
right? That this reality and this part of what it means that we don't just make disciples. It's not just that you come here and get more like Jesus. It's that in you coming here and get more, more like Jesus, this beautiful life that God invites us to is so beautiful that we can't believe the tragedy that people would choose to live without it. We are now experiencing this unbelievable, amazing thing. You see it all the time. Uh, you go eat at an amazing restaurant and you can't stop telling people about it, right? You go and watch an amazing movie and you can't stop telling people about it. Why isn't our faith like that? Why isn't our faith 10 times better that, than that? Why aren't we living a beautiful life in the way that Christ has so transformed us that we can't help but tell people, not through some track and not through some argument that sort of proves how wrong they are, but through this compelling way of our life that transforms and invites people into faith. We aren't the first people who have struggled with this. The Apostle Paul, when writing to probably his most problematic church, the church in Corinth, uh, was talking about all the different ways that they needed to come back to faith. All of the different ways in which they had settled for secondary, right? Uh, now, we're cheap. When we make recipes at our house, uh, I am always looking for the store brand of stuff. And most of the time, it's fine, right? There have been times, though, that the store brand is most definitely not the name brand, right? And, and in those times, I am told in no uncertain terms, buy this particular kind in this particular quantity. I don't care if the store brand's on sale. I don't care what the price is. We need this. Sometimes substitutes don't work. You need the real thing. And so Paul is saying to all of these Christians in Corinth who have substituted the real thing for sort of, you know, Dr. Thunder kind of name, non-name brand kind of stuff. They've sort of substituted it for, for not Jesus, but sort of Jesus light. He's really struggling how to explain to them how to live how to truly live the way that they are supposed to live. And after 10, after nine and a half, basically chapters, almost in frustration, we come to our scripture for, for today. It is from the letter of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and it starts in verse 31. And he has, boy, uh, if you think that you've been in churches that have had problems, you have not been in churches like the church in Corinth. And um, he has to yell at them about the Lord's Supper. He has to yell at them about sexual immorality. He has to yell at them about marriage. He has to yell at them because they continue to complain about him because he's sinful. No, no, no. They complain about him because other people preach better than he does. And so maybe their message is actually true and his is not. So in verse 31 of chapter, of chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, He's, he's been talking this whole time about the Lord's Supper and talking about food sacrificed to idols, and he's trying to get them to understand 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. So be very careful about your witness. Be very careful about the actions you have because other people are watching. Even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And here is the, here's the powerful verse right here. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Other translations say, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. How can they be better disciples? They can be better disciples by following Paul. Paul says, follow me because I'm trying to follow Christ. Now, this can sound like ego. This can sound like um, sort of conceited, sort of weird pastoral kind of, uh, hey, don't worry about him, just be like me and I'll get you there. This can sound like the Google Maps that leads you to the muddy field. But what Paul is saying, because Paul understands human psychology, is you need somebody who you can emulate. Even though our ego doesn't like it, we look around for people to figure out who we are going to follow. 
You do it in middle school, you do it at your first day of the job, you do it in church, you look around and find somebody that you think is someone you want to follow and you do what they do, right? So you look around and you figure out who are you going to emulate? Who are you going to follow? Who am I going to dress like? Who am I going to talk like? Who am I going to be like? No matter whatever group you're in, those rules change, right? But you figure out the, the relativity of, okay, so to be cool in this group, in the way that I want to be cool, you have to do this. What Paul is saying here is that if you want to go and make disciples, you don't need to yell at people with a bullhorn. You don't need to master some sort of, you know, lawyerly 27 point argument. What you need to do is to be so focused and completely committed to following the beautiful life that God has invited you to, that when people choose to do what you do, they can't help but be drawn to him. Now, we'd rather have a 27 point argument because it's easier than to have people look at our lives. It's easier than to have people really know how much we struggle. It's easier than to be open and honest. But one of the beautiful, but, but one of the ways in which we sort of go off the rails here is we think that if there's anything broken in us, then those will be the places where people just sort of throw their hands up and say, I quit. But uh, you know, Leonard Cohen has this beautiful uh, quote about um, the brokenness is beautiful because that's where the light comes in. In our brokenness, when people are able to see that we have screwed up and we continue to screw up and we continue to come back to God, then that allows them to know that their brokenness is not bigger than God's love. It allows them to know that they don't have to suddenly perform perfectly so that they can be loved as well. When we are fully and completely who we are, true disciples, disciples who are broken, who continue to, st- who continue to fall down, but who continue to get back up because we know God's love for us and God's forgiveness for us comes over and over and over again, then we can be the kind of people living the kind of beautiful life that draws other people in. We make disciples who make disciples. And what that means is we are so focused on living the beautiful life of God. We are so focused on being transformed by the goodness of God in our own life and in our own hearts. We are so focused on mercy and grace and forgiveness that when we need it, we gladly accept it. And when others need it, we gladly pour it out. We are so focused on that in our church that it overflows and overwhelms and we are aware that we are inviting people to imitate us. Not because we've got the routine down perfectly and are gonna make a perfect 10, but because even in our brokenness, everything we do points people back to God. Through the love of Jesus, we make disciples who make disciples because God's love and grace and mercy and call to you is too beautiful to ignore. Would you pray with me? God, we lay our lives at your feet. We have settled for store brand Jesus too often. Jesus that looks too much like us, loves the people we love and hates the people we hate. And God, we confess that that's not good enough. We confess, God, that instead we want to serve you in all of our brokenness and all of the mess of our lives, we give it over to you we choose to walk toward the beautiful life of you. And we pray, God, that you will help us to be transformed so that as people imitate us, they are actually imitating you. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship. And thank you most of all for Christ Jesus, the one who makes all of this possible through his life, death, and resurrection. For it is in his name we pray. Amen.